Thanks very much for inviting me here to, uh, to Google. My name is Joe Serencioni. I'm the president of Plowshares Fund, which is a public foundation. We raise and give away grants to people who are working on nuclear weapons issues, primarily those people who we think are going to be the most effective at eliminating nuclear weapons and reducing our nuclear dangers. I've been doing this for about a year. And uh, about two years ago, I wrote a book called Bomb Scare, the history and future of nuclear weapons, which is what's gotten me invited here to Google. And in my view, there are two major threats to the planet, and really only two that threaten destruction on a global scale. And that's the threat of nuclear catastrophe and the threat of global warming. These are the only two threats that really could challenge the existence of, of life on the planet. They're both caused by machines that we made. They're both reversible. There's nothing inevitable about either one. But to do so, they both require new leadership and a fundamentally new way of thinking about the problem. And I've been very encouraged in just the last year to see how this new leadership and this new thinking is developing on both fronts. There's a lot to say about climate change, but I'm just going to focus in on the other twin threat, non stopping the proliferation of nuclear weapons. Although the two are connected in a way that, that hasn't really been apparent before for lots of people. There are some who now think that whatever the waste and cost and security problems of nuclear power, you're going to need a rapid expansion of nuclear power in order to prevent global warming. So people are talking about a nuclear renaissance or the construction of 400 new nuclear power plants over the next few decades. Well, if you do that, if you see the number of nuclear power plants in the world double, there are about 400 now, if they double to another 400, uh, so 800 or 1,000 plants, that means you're going to have to build new fuel factories new facilities that can enrich the uranium into fuel rods, or that can reprocess the fuel afterwards, separating out the plutonium. The trouble with that is that both those facilities can be used for weapons purposes. This is exactly the issue with Iran. The plant that is under contention with Iran, they say is used only to enrich the fuel for their reactor. Those same centrifuges can be used to enrich it to high levels for, for weapons-grade uranium to make a nuclear weapon. If suddenly you double or triple the number of nuclear reactors in the world, you're talking about not five or six countries that know how to make this fuel, but maybe 15, 20, or 25 countries who would now be a screwdriver's turn away from nuclear weapons capability. In my view, it is immoral to be promoting nuclear power without addressing this nuclear weapons side of the industry. You can't rush headlong into an effort to cure one planetary threat if it's going to make the other planetary threat worse. Here's part of why I think we're at what many analysts consider a nuclear tipping point. So this, this point in time where decisions we make, policy choices we make, can determine whether we tip over into one or more nuclear catastrophes, or if we change our history, change the direction we're going in, and pull back from these various nuclear breaks. Here's just three examples of the kinds of tipping points we worry about. The first is the threat of a terrorist nuclear bomb, of a group like Al-Qaeda getting their hands on a nuclear weapon. Unlike states, nuclear te new terrorists could not be deterred from nuclear weapons. They don't have a national future or national territory to defend. If Al-Qaeda got a bomb, it is very likely they would use the bomb. The good news is that terrorists cannot make a nuclear bomb from scratch. They can't make the stuff of the bomb. They can't make highly enriched uranium or plutonium. You need a factory for that. You need billions of dollars in investment. You need a huge energy source. In other words, you need a nation, a country, makes nuclear material, makes nuclear weapons. But if terrorists can get it, then with a limited amount of scientific and technical assistance, say from sympathetic Pakistani scientists or out-of-work 
Russian scientists, they could fashion a crude nuclear device, a Hiroshima-type bomb that could be delivered in a truck, in a plane, in a van, and detonated with relative ease. So the trick is to stop the terrorists from getting the stuff, from preventing them from getting the highly enriched uranium or possibly plutonium that they need to make the bomb. My worst nuclear nightmare is not that Iran's going to get this material and give it to Al-Qaeda. They're at war with each other. They're enemies of each other. My greatest nuclear nightmare is Pakistan. Pakistan is a country right now with enough material for 100 nuclear weapons. We're an unstable government with strong Islamic fundamentalist influences in the military and intelligence services, and with Al-Qaeda in its territory. Osama bin Laden is in Pakistan. He is closer to getting a nuclear weapon now than he ever has been before. If Pakistan destabilizes, if the army splits or is distracted by the need to put down urban insurgencies, for example, who gets the weapons? Who gets the material? Who gets the scientists who know how to build the weapons? That's why, that's one of the nuclear nightmares that could happen overnight. Pakistan could be could turn from a major non-NATO ally of the United States to our worst nuclear nightmare. Here's another, the threat that a new country will get a nuclear weapon like Iran. Iran is building the facilities that now, just in the last few months, have made it nuclear capable. That is, they probably have enough raw material on hand to, within a matter of months, reprocess that material and make it into a, a crude, probably large bomb. How long would it take them to do that? There's a little bit of debate, but somewhere between six months to two years to actually go from where they are to a nuclear weapon capability. But the danger is not that Iran would then use that weapon to attack Israel or attack the United States. Deterrence is alive and well. One bomb doesn't do you a lot of good. You use it, you're done, you're now vulnerable. The United States, Israel, any other country Iran tried to attack with that weapon would surely respond with massive and overwhelming uh, attacks. So the danger is really what happens in the neighborhood. What do, what do Iran's neighbors do knowing that Iran has or soon could have this capability? I'll tell you what they do. They're doing it right now. In the last two years, over a dozen Middle East countries have started nuclear civilian programs, power plants under construction or under consideration, uh, nuclear research programs underway. They're starting that decades-long process to start to build up their own nuclear technological infrastructure that could be turned into weapons purposes down the road. In other words, these programs, these decisions by Turkey and Egypt and Saudi Arabia and Dubai to suddenly invest billions in nuclear power reactors is not being caused because they saw Al Gore's movie and decided that they had to reduce their carbon footprint. This is not about energy. This is a hedge against Iran. And this is the danger, that the Middle East goes from a, country, a region with one nuclear power, Israel, to one with two, three, four, five nuclear weapons states and the unresolved territorial religious and, uh, and regional disputes. That's a recipe for nuclear war. That's why you have to stop Iran. That's why you have to stop North Korea, because the ripple effect that, that, that would come, come out from those regions. Here's nuclear tipping point number three, and I'll stop with this one. And that's the danger from the existing 25,000 nuclear weapons in the world. Right now, there's approximately nine nations in the world that have nuclear weapons or the material to make these weapons. That's enough destructive capability to destroy the Earth at least 25 times over. Most of those weapons are held by the United States and Russia. Together, we have about 96% of the global arsenals. Each of us, the United States and Russia, keep about 1,500 to 2,000 weapons on hair trigger alert ready to launch in 15 minutes notice. So we both have missiles with nuclear warheads that could destroy cities ready to go in 15 minutes. Why? What nuclear mission requires that? What military mission requires that? 
This is a Cold War posture that continues 15, 20 years after the Cold War ends, has ended. So an accident, a miscalculation, an unauthorized use could start this nuclear war. And if you think these accidents couldn't happen, think again. They already have. Last summer, the United States had a B-52, our strategic bomber, that flew across the country with six nuclear weapons on it that nobody knew were there. It was supposed to be transporting conventional cruise missiles to a depot down in Louisiana for destruction. But they loaded nuclear-armed cruise missiles on the wings of this plane. Six weapons, each ten times the size of the bomb that destroyed Hiroshima. So this plane was carrying 60 Hiroshimas. Nobody knew they were there. They violated seven different security procedures that were supposed to stop this from happening. If you had asked nuclear experts before it happened, could this happen, they would have said no, it was impossible. And yet that plane landed in Louisiana and sat on the tarmac overnight with these weapons protected by a barbed wire fence and a normal security guard. It was only the next day when a crewman noticed that there was a red mark on those indicating they were nuclear warheads, not conventional warheads. He told his boss, his boss didn't believe him. A couple hours later, the place was surrounded and high security procedures were, were, were instituted. That was last year. Last month, two nuclear submarines collided in the Atlantic, both with nuclear-armed missiles on board. As one UK parliamentarian asked, would the right honorable gentleman explain how one submarine carrying weapons of mass destruction collided with another submarine carrying weapons of mass destruction in the middle of the second largest ocean in the world? <laughs> so if you think that these kinds of nuclear accidents can't happen, they already have. Planes last year, subs this year, what if it's missiles next year? So we have to do something about this threat, our own weapons, as well as the weapons that others might get, as well as securing the material that terrorists might get. So that, if that's got your attention, good. If you thought that because the Cold War was over, these nuclear weapon threats were gone, think again. Pay attention. This is a matter of life and death. This is a matter of city survival, maybe planet survival. Now the good news. In order to prevent these threats from happening, we need new leaders, new policies, new approaches, new thinking, and we need everybody involved. There isn't one magic guy, even if he is President of the United States, who can change this around. This is going to take a group effort. We've been living with these dangers for 65 years. Changing them is going to take a movement. Fortunately, we're starting to see that movement take shape. We do have new leaders coming to the fore in the United States, of course, but also in most other major countries of the world. In the last couple of years, there's been a nearly unprecedented, simultaneous transfer of executive leadership. So new, new leaders in the UK, new leaders in France, new leaders in Germany, new leaders in Israel. There might be a new leader in Iran, Ahmadinejad, I think might lose the election in June. There's a new leader in, in Russia. These means that there are new leaders open to new ideas, less wed to the policies of the past, looking to make dramatic action. And we've seen the general recognition that these threats are increasing, that the existing policy, the so-called Bush Doctrine, that was supposed to reduce or eliminate these threats by overthrowing one rogue dictator after another, has failed, has made the situation worse, not better. Every nonproliferation issue that the administration inherited eight years ago has gotten worse under this doctrine, not better. So you've seen this policy collapse and leave a vacuum, an opening for new policy. And a new policy has now emerged from a very unexpected source. An, an idea that used to be considered a utopian pipe dream, the elimination of nuclear weapons, the kinds of things the Los Alamos scientists after the Manhattan Project talked about in the 40s, or you'd have mass movements in the 50s, or during the 80s, demonstrations in Central Park of a million people demanding the end to nuclear weapons. Normally seen as an idea of the left, a utopian ideal that couldn't be reached, that idea that we could actually eliminate these weapons has now been embraced by some of America's top security elite. And 
actually it's happening. The epicenter of this movement is right here. It's in Palo Alto. It's at the Hoover Institution in Stanford, a conservative think tank inside a generally conservative university. And it consists of Republicans and Democrats. So former Secretary of State George Shultz at the Hoover Institute, a Republican, has joined up with former Secretary of Defense Bill Perry at the Hoover Institute, a Democrat, and enlisted Henry Kissinger, former Secretary of State under Richard Nixon, and Sam Nunn, the former Democratic Chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee, people with impeccable defense credentials, people who helped build the U.S. nuclear empire, are now saying it's time to take it down. It's time to eliminate it. These weapons are obsolete. They are not an asset to us. They are a liability. These are the weapons and the only weapons that can threaten the destruction of our nation. It's time to get rid of them. They wrote a Wall Street Journal op-ed in January 2007, and they placed it in the Wall Street Journal on purpose. They knew exactly what they were doing. They knew the audience they were going for. They followed it up with another op-ed in 2008, and they've had a series of conferences, and they've started this intellectual current that has now rippled through the, the security debate in this country and other countries and is one support. The idea is simple. We have to reaffirm the goal of a world free of nuclear weapons and outline a series of practical steps that can take us towards that goal. New treaties to reduce the weapons in the world. New treaties to ban nuclear tests, ban the production of any new weapons material. Concentrated efforts to resolve the conflicts at various areas of the world, particularly those points of intense proliferation concern like the Middle East and Northeast Asia, and other steps as well. And their program, their idea, their movement has now been endorsed and embraced by over 70% of the still living former secretaries of defense and former secretaries of state and national security uh, advisors. Like Jim Baker, I spoke with him personally about this down at Rice University last year. Frank Carlucci, Bud McFarlane, Melvin Laird, have I mentioned a Democrat yet? These are all Republicans, as well as Madeleine Albright and, and Colin Powell, the more recent Secretaries of State. They all agree that now is the time to reaffirm what's been U.S. policy for 60 years, that we seek a world without nuclear weapons, but now move it from lip service to action. Get serious about this. And this comes not from a, a moralist pr perspective, although some do feel this is a moral campaign, not from a religious belief, although some do feel that as stewards of this earth, we have a responsibility to protect the earth, and this is a religious mission. No, this comes from realism, this hard core of, a, of, 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 a, of security thinking that is basically motivated most of U.S. national security policy. The realist understanding that there are definite threats out there that require great power intervention to to reduce, or in this case, eliminate. This call has been picked up by the Prime Minister of Great Britain, Gordon Brown, who is in some competition over this. He wants the UK to be in the forefront of the effort for a global ban on nuclear weapons. He wants the United Kingdom to become a disarmament laboratory, he says. Or how about the conservative French President Sarkozy? He's just presented to the United Nations a plan on behalf of the European Union all the countries of the European Union, a very ambitious just nuclear disarmament and proliferation plan that includes uh, the vision embracing the goal of a world free of nuclear weapons, support for the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, and other practical steps. This, uh, this call has now been embraced by Barack Obama. He, during the campaign, get detailed the most comprehensive, progressive, practical integrated nuclear policy that any candidate has carried into the office of the presidency. He's taken that campaign promise and now started to implement it as nuclear policy. You can go to whitehouse.gov and look under foreign policy and look under the three-step program that he's now s summarized as his basic program. It consists of pledges to secure, Let's get serious about this nuclear terrorist threat. 
He's pledged to beef up the existing programs that we have that work to secure or eliminate nuclear materials and move it into an action plan that would do, accomplish this globally in his first four years in office. The second step is to reduce. He's pledged to begin negotiation of new treaties with Russia. He's already sent his representatives over to Moscow two weeks ago to outline a path for it, how the US and Russia could start reducing their weapons. Our 10,000 weapons can be taken down to much lower numbers. The Russian 14,000 nuclear weapons can be taken down. We do it step by step, verifiable, irreversible reductions. So we take the warheads out of operational status and we disassemble them. We eliminate them. I personally believe we could do a new treaty that would take us down to about a thousand warheads each. More than enough for any national security need. But a real demonstrated commitment of both the United States and Russia to the eventual elimination of, of nuclear weapons. And Obama gets this. He keeps talking about leading by example that we have to start. So it's not a question of the other guy's nukes. It's our nukes too. And if we expect other countries not to get these weapons, we have to have one standard that we don't want them either, that none of us are going to have these weapons. You promise not to, keep, not to get these weapons. We promise to get rid of our weapons. How exactly we get there is still to be determined. That's why this is a group effort. That's why this has got to be a national and international effort. Get the best minds in the country thinking about this. But it's not just his program. It's not just a plan. It's not just the campaign promise slapped up on a website. He started to appoint some of the best people in the country to help implement this. For example, two years ago when the Democrats took over Congress, their first bill, HR1, SR1, was to take the unfulfilled recommendations of the 9-11 Commission and put them into law. The 9-11 Commission said that the greatest threat to the United States was a terrorist getting a nuclear weapon. And it recommended, and the Congress then mandated, the establishment of an office to coordinate all government programs to the prevention of these nuclear proliferation and nuclear terrorism. President Bush did nothing about that for two years. On day four, President Obama appointed Gary Seymour, a noted international expert, to head up that office. It's going to be in the White House, a few corridors away from the president himself. Not just one guy, but a staff of 10. Gary Seymour is now putting that office together. So it's starting to operationalize these plans. He's also picked some of the best people in the country to be at the State Department, where Hillary Clinton has testified about her plans, the president's plans and her plans, to do these negotiations, to do these international efforts, to lead by example, to get the international cooperation we need to secure and eliminate these weapons. And she started to appoint Bob Einhorn, one of the country's leading experts, to be the Under Secretary of State for policy on this issue. This is the former John Bolton position. So just as John Bolton spent years destroying the new international negotiating process, we now have a guy in place who's going to rebuild this. This is a 180 degree turn. He, he's, a, he's about to appoint one of my colleagues, Rose Gottermiller, a Russian expert, a non-proliferation expert, to be in charge as Assistant Secretary for negotiating these agreements. These are all good people and it doesn't stop there. The science advisor to the President has is, is been nominated as John Holdren, one of the brightest minds in the country on both global warming and nuclear proliferation. So in one person, he embodies this synthesis. He sees these twin threats and understands them both. Or Secretary of Energy, Stephen Chu, uh, the first Nobel laureate that I'm aware of to be appointed to a cabinet position. So get this, it's not, it's not political people, it's not corporate people, it's not his political friends who he's putting in these cabinet positions. These are key national security positions and they're going to the best people in the field. There's differences among them, some like Ambassador Susan Rice, the new UN ambassador, have a real transformationalist view. I think they share President Obama's vision that we have to eliminate these weapons, that we have to think about them in a fundamentally different way. Or Ivo Dalder, the person who's going to be the new 
U.S. ambassador to NATO, wrote a great article in Foreign Affairs last year, November, December of last year, called The Logic of Zero, probably the best article written on this subject in, in several years, outlining the kind of this vision and practical ways to implement it with Israel, with Iran, with North Korea, with Russia. What does it mean if you really commit to eliminating nuclear weapons? Those people, I think, are the real transformationalists. And you have others, good people, but who, who, who basically want to take sort of incremental steps towards this goal, who are concentrating more on securing the treaty or securing the reduction, or maybe, maybe you've seen in the news lately the idea that we should trade away some of these past programs that might be stupid and expensive and of no use, like putting missile systems that don't work in Europe uh, to defeat an Iranian missile threat that doesn't yet exist, but instead of just giving them up, we should trade them for something. We should try to use that as a lever against Russia to pressure them or threaten them. If you don't cooperate with us, we will deploy this system. There's still that kind of thinking that goes on. Fortunately, I think you're seeing Obama do what he said he was going to do, take control of this. He said, in, in response to critics who argued for why was he keeping on Secretary Robert Gates as, as, as Secretary of Defense? Why was he appointing Jim Jones, a fairly moderate figure to be the head director of national, the sec, national security advisor? He said, the change comes from me. And that's what I think he's doing. I think he's appointing a team of the most capable people with a variety of views out there to help him implement his transformational vision. And he recently commented to the papers and when criticism of this uh, letter to the Russian president was, came out in recent days, that there was no quid pro quo here, that this was not a threat to Russia. And instead he emphasized the, the vision, I think, helps you get successful deals, helps you negotiate tough agreements. He emphasized the need for cooperation and the mutual benefits of cooperating on both stopping the Iranian threat and coming up with a, work, a workable, cooperative missile defense system, and once again, the need for both countries to cooperate to reduce their, their nuclear arsenals. So I'm, I'm excited about what's going on in Washington, what I see happening in the world. I think we're in a new moment, a new opportunity to fundamentally change U.S. nuclear policy, and by so doing, to transform global nuclear policy. But I know this, as sure as these policy moments open up, they close. They don't last long. So we got to hit this moment. We have to make the most of this opportunity, the most of this new leadership, the most of this new movement towards the elimination of nuclear weapons to turn U.S. policy away from the catastrophic paths towards the reduction and eventual elimination of all these nuclear threats. I think we can do that. That's why I'm the president of Plowshares. That's why we search the world for the best people with the best ideas who can work on implementing this vision, on implementing these practical security steps. That's why we ask people to give us their money so that we can give it to these best and brightest out there, to give them the resources they need to get the job done. And I see it happening. I see it happening in micro grants. We just gave a grant to Hans Blix, one of the world's leaders on this issue, to pull together a conference in Washington at the end of April of the leaders of all the various international efforts that are now underway for the elimination of nuclear weapons, ranging from the Pugwatch Conference to the Nuclear Threat Initiative to a brand new group called Global Zero. Watch for their website in a few weeks, globalzero.org. Very exciting stuff. Pull them all together to issue a joint statement of support for, for this new international drive. We pulled together a meeting of top Russians and uh, US experts just last week in Washington. So the guy who used to run the Russian strategic rocket force, who had his hands on the nuclear triggers, met up with the guy who used to run the American strategic command, plus other experts, Republicans and Democrats alike, sitting together brainstorming thinking of options that we could present the administration for how to move forward a new, new U.S.-Russian cooperation. And here's the really great part. We have an administration that wants these ideas. The results of our deliberations were fed directly into the administration. It's up to them whether they take them or not, 
but we're doing the brainstorming for them. We're doing similar work on the possibility of negotiations, how to chart successful negotiations with both North Korea and Iran. A lot of these things don't cost a lot of money, but they do require you to know where the best people are, to wire them together, and most of all, to seize the moment, to understand that small amounts of money, small gatherings of people can make a big difference to help move the policy in a fundamental new direction. I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to talk to you here at Google and to go up at the website at Arthur's at, at Google. It's a pleasure and I'm happy to take any kind of questions that, that you have, whether verbally delivered or electronically. Thanks. <laughs> Go for it. Question. So actually, I have two questions. First, the easier one, which is an engineering one. So I that's going to be easy. Okay, go. That's going to be the easier one. Okay, go. So I had a couple of months ago, as a guest here, Joseph Bonametti from uh, I think he's currently at NASA. He's a rocket scientist, uh -huh. but he's a big proponent of uh, using thorium as a fuel source for. Uh, you know, I guess civilian nuclear energy. Right. I think uh, I'm not. I mean, he is working with a group that consists of uh, experts from the Lawrence uh, Berkeley Livermore Labs and from other people around the country. Uh, I would encourage you to to look and, and promote that talk because it's. It, I was quite impressed by the technology. I mean, the technology is inherently safe. There is no nuclides that could be used in any sort of nuclear weapons environment. Uh, the reactor cannot go critical like Chernobyl. I mean, if something goes bad, it just shut itself, itself down. And you know what? I mean, it's a technology that has the potential to solve the two big problems that you mentioned at the beginning of your talk, CO2 and, uh, and proliferation. I think uh, you know if if you have you know, like sort of a plug you know, like to the administration, they should really seriously consider this. I mean, we haven't done anything with it. We had a reactor in the '60s which went operational and was used to sort of you know, like gather engineering data. Nothing ever since, because it seems that the industry, for various reasons, you know, like into which I don't have the time to elaborate now, was not interested at all uh, into. To developing this technology. Okay. So, so it, it really, I, I believe that it deserves a serious work. I mean, like it nails two of the big problems because I mean, wind and solar is great, but I mean, we need a serious replacement for coal, and you know, the only serious replacement for coal is you know, like a serious uh, source of energy. Let me do the thorium first, real quick. I promise you, I will look into this, but I'm also skeptical. About this thorium solution has been around for decades, as you yes. mentioned. People were talking about this in the 50s. And it's never proved to be operationally um, effective. And there are some serious uh, cost problems, because one of the ways to, to make this viable gets very complicated from an engineering standpoint. It's absolutely true that on the molecular level, on the atomic level, using thorium as a fuel does exactly what you say. It's, a, it's, it's just at the practical you know, sort of point of the whole operation to produce energy at, in large quantities at an, effect, at, a, at, a, at, a, at an effective cost, it fails. But some of the best people in the field um, I know are involved in this story of technology and have sort of lobbied me on this. And I will now, I promise you, I will now go revisit this issue and see maybe there's something I've missed over the last few years and maybe it's become more viable. Well, but I, I mean, the talk is I know, public as well. I, 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 okay, yeah. so it's up here? It's, a, it's, it's on YouTube as well. I mean, I'll go take this public. I don't know, like, I, if, if, if we, I'll go know, take if a you, look. If you or other people talk with other experts, we should probably make sure that they are not coming from the established industries that were built on building right. actually with their weapons. So they had a different interest. Right. I mean, I okay. mean from what I heard. Well, you're right. That was the easy one. I'll go okay. take a look. So okay, they, when's the hard one? The, the hard one is really a policy thing. I mean, you know, like we're talking here about disarming everybody, which is a beautiful idea. I completely subscribe to this. Yeah, we should, we should get the world rid of nuclear weapons. However, it seems that there's a small number of 
call it whatever you want, rogue nations, villains, super villains, that just think and operate in the mode where you're know, like, okay, we're not being taken seriously by the world. Right. The only way we're going to be taken seriously is we're going to build something. Exactly. A nuclear weapon. I mean, and the latest example is North Korea. Right. And Iran, you know, like, is on the way there somewhere. So, I mean, I guess with the Russians, and, and with, especially with the British and the French, it's sort of a no-brainer. I mean, these seem like intelligent people who make their decisions in a rational way. But what about the other guys? They are, and, and Pakistan, which has a really volatile situation. How will we, what are the incentives to make them sit at the table and subscribe? Okay, you know, we're, we're done with, with this sort of thing. Got it. Let me give you two cuts of this. Sure. And the first is sort of the uh, theoretical analysis. So you do international security theory, and there's various models for why people do things. Uh, the reason I'm here is because I wrote this book called Bomb Scare. Now, I like it. Columbia University Press wanted a primer on the issue, something that you can read easily and get the main stuff and have a lot of footnotes. You can go deeper if you want. It's a good book, but I wouldn't say it's, it's path-breaking, except for this area. This is my one theoretical contribution. It's why do countries get nuclear weapons? And it turns out, you can look at all the literature and break it down, and there's three core reasons. Security, number one. They get it because they want to, they, they want to be secure. That's why we got it. We thought Hitler was building a nuclear bomb, sure. and we wanted to have one, not to use it, but to deter him from using it. And you can follow that chain. The Soviets did the same thing when they found out that we had it. They thought they had to match that capability. Other countries would feel the same way. India does a nuclear test. Pakistan follows a month later. Security. The second reason is prestige. Just what you say. The big guys have this. If we're going to be taken seriously, we have to get it. You could look at India's decision to get nuclear weapons as a prestige-driven decision. Uh, some people would say France. Did they need nuclear weapons in 1960 when they tested their first one? Not really, but they wanted to cling to their great power status even as their empire collapsed. Uh, the third is politics, mostly domestic politics. So, so forces within the country uh, propel leaders in this direction. Think of Ahmadinejad, president of Iran. He uses this national security issue to enhance his power. He poses as the warrior president who can defend the country against the West, and this nuclear issue strikes a real nationalist chord. So it works for him uh, as an issue. You can think of other countries the same way. It turns out that just like as every particle has an antiparticle, every driver has a matching barrier. So security. Countries choose not to get nuclear weapons because they believe their security is more enhanced in a, if, they're, if in a region where neither they or their neighbors have, don't have nuclear weapons. So Brazil and Argentina had nuclear weapons programs in the 80s. Brazil had drilled a test shaft to test a nuclear device. They walked it back, and they negotiated out between the two of them uh, a, a treaty and inspection regime, and then made it continent-wide. So all of South America, which has countries that could build nuclear weapons, such as Chile and others, is a nuclear free zone. The Treaty of Talataloco declares no one will have nuclear weapons and sets up its own continent inspection regime that's overlaid with the international IE inspection regime. Real good example, it works for them. You could say the same for South Africa. The South African government secretly built six nuclear weapons in the 80s and on the eve of transition to majority rule in 91, disclosed these six nuclear weapons and dismantled them. The key here is that Nelson Mandela could have reversed that decision. He could have decided that he wanted to be a nuclear power, the black majority government with a nuclear weapon. But he decided that his security was better served in an Africa where no one has nuclear weapons, which is the situation today, rather than starting a nuclear arms race. So all of Africa is also a nuclear free zone. Nobody is building these weapons. So that's security. Prestige. Countries can find prestige by not pursuing nuclear weapons. South Africa is an excellent case. They made their mark on the world stage in 1995 
with a key intervention in the Non-Proliferation Treaty Conference, where they brokered the deal that saved that whole conference from collapse and extended this treaty. They got prestige out of that. Politics, the politics in Japan, for example, worked the other way. The Japanese public doesn't want anything to do with nuclear weapons, thank you. And they pressure their politicians not to do this. So understanding these barriers and drivers helps you understand how you have to set up situations where you're decreasing the drivers and increasing the barriers. And this is exactly what the National Threat Assessment on Iran talks about. And this is an almost a direct quote, that we have to find a way to convince Iran that it can meet its security, prestige, and regional goals in a non-nuclear path. They don't know what exactly the combination of pressures and incentives is, but that's the way to look at it. And that's the calibration you have to make. How can you make Iran secure in its environment and convince them, and this is the only way you can do it, you cannot force them to give it up. It has never worked. You've got to convince them to give it up, to make their own decision. We know this works because we did it with Libya. Instead of trying to change the regime, we change the regime's behavior. And Muammar Gaddafi went from the poster child of a rogue state leader to a man President Bush calls a model. The Libyan nuclear program is disassembled. It's now in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. The missile program was taken down. Chemical weapons factories closed. U.S. investment is flowing into Libya. Libya is being integrated into international and Western economics. If you can do it with Libya, I think you can do it with North Korea, although it's a lot harder much stranger regime, and I think you can do it with Iran, although it's even harder still, because they're in a real power position. They're getting stronger, even as we get weaker. But that's, that's the way you've got to look at these things, and understand that over the past 15 years, more countries have given up nuclear weapons and nuclear programs than have tried to get them, and we're right on that cusp. If we can get it right now, if we can turn this around, even with the two hard cases, and these are the only two, by the way, North Korea and Iran, then we can turn that corner. We can turn that around. And if we fail, then I'm afraid we might be off to the races. And a lot more people will emulate or respond to the Iranian and North Korean programs. That's a great answer. Thank you. Okay. Buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> so with the reduction of, of weapons, you have visual material at least stored somewhere in track, presumably. What, how do you suggest go about in the international environment tracking visual material and story. Let me give you a, a small example, an example, and then a, and a systematic answer. We have a program in the United States that we started through Sam Nunn, uh, Senator Nunn and Senator Luger, called the Cooperative Threat Reduction Program. We spend about a billion dollars a year on it, and we use it to uh, secure, help Russia and the four other former Soviet republics secure their material and, uh, and eliminate it where possible. And this is actually one of the great things about nuclear weapons material. A lot of it can be completely eliminated. So as part of that program, we purchased 500 tons of highly enriched uranium. So you're taking all these warheads down, you're opening them up, you're running the construction process in reverse, you're disassembling them, you take all the parts away, you can destroy all those, there's some questionable materials in there that are going to cause some harm. But the real problem is the core. Now you have the pit. You have 25 or so kilograms of highly enriched uranium in, in there, or in some cases plutonium. But what are you going to do with that weapons-grade uranium? We bought 500 tons of former pits, highly enriched uranium pits, and we downblended. We mixed it with natural uranium and we run the enrichment process in reverse until we got it down to three or four percent. So instead of 90% highly enriched U-235, it's now four or five percent U-235. That's what you can make fuel out of. We turn that uranium into fuel rods, and we sell the fuel rods to American power companies. One out of every 10 light bulbs in the United States is, is powered by electricity generated from so former Soviet warheads. Weapons that used to threaten our existence now light our homes. We get about 20% of the energy in the United States from nuclear power. Half of that comes from fuel from this former, former Soviet material. 
this is a tremendous success story. They call it megatons to megawatts. <laughs> but there's another 500 tons of highly rich uranium sitting over there. What are we waiting for? Let's go buy that. You know one of the problems? The uranium mining industry and the mining workers are worried about deflating the price of uranium. Look, I'm all for labor rights, but we should not be letting commodity price dictate national security policy. Let's go buy the stuff, down blend it, and scoop it up everywhere we can. So we have these programs that can do that. We have programs that uh, can take some of these civilian research reactors that are in some 40 countries around the world that are fueled by highly enriched uranium. Uh, how do we know this? Because we sold them to these countries. We in Russia peppered the planet with these civilian research reactors. And they were in places like Texas A&M has a research reactor. There must be a research reactor on this peninsula someplace that's fueled by highly enriched uranium. In some of these cases, there's enough highly enriched uranium in those reactors to make bombs. And we have programs that will go in, we just did it at the University of Prague last year, and go take the fuel out of those reactors and transport it back to the country of origin, in this case, Russia. And this is done in like Mission Impossible style. That particular job was done in the dead of night, midnight, with a heavily armed convoy taking the highly enriched uranium out on a specially guarded and sealed off road to the airport. It was then flown to Russia for, for, for disposal. The irony is there's high tech around this operation, but there wasn't high tech security around the reactor. They guarded it like they guarded library books. And that's the situation you're in. You've got 40 countries with a couple hundred reactors sitting around like that, and we're doing this kind of operation to six or seven a year. Six or seven a year? Well, you know, what happens if Osama bin Laden discovers that they can, he can go to the research reactor in Vietnam, or Ghana, or Argentina, and get enough material for a bomb? How long do we think it's going to take them to figure this out? That's why Sam Nunn says we're in a race between catastrophe and cooperation. I believe that. Let's take these programs, beef them up, get the job done, let's do it before they, they figure out that there's ways that they can get a bomb easier than waiting for Pakistan to destabilize. So we, these programs work. We just haven't been putting the, 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 the resources behind them, and they haven't had presidential attention. And that's why I'm so encouraged by what Obama's doing, the appointment of this new office, and now we've got to see if they translate that intention and that capability into action. How's that? That's great. Well, indulge us as well. Mentioned very briefly your thoughts on missile defense. Would you mind elaborating a bit? It's been in the news lately. I've been doing missile defense since I got my job as on the staff of the House Armed Services Committee. I joined the committee in 1985. My first assignment was to oversee the Strategic Defense Initiative Program. The anniversary of that program is coming up, March 23, 1983. Ronald Reagan gave a speech about missile defenses. Um, at the time, I think there was tremendous enthusiasm that we could actually do this, that we had technology that was good enough, smart enough, to actually be able to hit a bullet with a bullet, to intercept a warhead in the cold emptiness of outer space with one of our interceptors. And it turns out you can do that under ideal conditions. You can actually do that. It's been compared to hitting a golf ball from the Washington Monument to the Empire State Building, while both the Washington Monument and the Empire State Building are moving at 10,000 miles an hour. And it's really, really hard to do it. It turns out we can do it under ideal conditions, but it requires a cooperative enemy. It requires an enemy who's firing a missile at a, at a time and a vector that we know, and that is giving us a warhead with the characteristics that we absolutely know. And you guys here will know this better than anybody. That, you know, you don't actually see the warhead. It's not like there's a little camera in the interceptor and it sees the warhead. No, it sees dots. It sees pixels. And it is extremely easy for those pixels to appear like nothing the computer's been programmed to see. Or this is the or to, for that, that warhead to be accompanied by decoys. Little, now I'm not talking about big elaborate, I'm talking about pieces of chaff aluminum wire that in rotation will give off a signature identical to the signature of the larger warhead. And, if, and you can hide the warhead in a cloud of chaff, you can use balloon decoys, emptiness about a space, balloons <coughs> will act, 
just like heavy metal warheads. You can put your warheads inside balloons. There's a dozen different things you can do. In fact, the CIA estimate is that any country that could have an ICBM, an intercontinental ballistic missile with a warhead, has got the capability to deploy at least six different types of countermeasures. And that's the problem. That's the problem. We can't actually solve what they call the discrimination problem. Even if we can hit a bullet with a bullet, we have to know exactly where and, 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 and how and that, that bullet is traveling and what exactly it looks like, and that's the failure. And, the, and we've never tested it under realistic conditions. All these tests, these are strapped down chicken tests. Can I shoot a chicken? Sure, strap it down, hold it still, bang, got it, dead, I can shoot a chicken. If I shoot a chicken in the middle of a bunch of roosters running around, that's a little harder. We've never done a realistic missile defense test. Never, never. We've never actually seen if the enemy did what we think the enemy can do, can we shoot it down? No, you know why? Because we can't do it. Because we can't do it. And that means the system fails. And that means the funding dries up. And that means the whole thing grinds to a halt. In my view, missile defense is the wrong, longest running scam in the history of the Department of Defense. It's time to bring this program down to earth. There are missile defense systems that do work, mostly against the short range threats, the SCUDs, the actual kinds of missiles that Iran really has, not the imaginary missiles that they might have in 20 years. So we got to cooperate with Russia, with our allies, to develop real defenses against the real threat and test them to make sure they work and don't pay the contractor on a promise. So you would support a theater defense system, but not necessarily? I support missile defenses that are operationally effective, are, d are deployed against actual threats, and don't distract from our other strategic and national security goals. And you down a little bit, though, would you fund missile defense research? Absolutely. Okay. Got to keep researching this stuff. I think there is a possibility, a couple of decades out, that we could develop speed of light weapons that could do missile defense. I believe there's a possibility. I think there are countermeasures against that, too. So laser weapons, you know, they don't work so well against shiny objects or objects that are spinning. Uh, but it's possible. So I would, I, would, I would research this. And the short range, the in the atmospheric threats, the short range scuds, you don't have that decoy problem because they don't really go in outer space. So there's no decoys that can be deployed, at least traditional decoys. Um, so yeah, I think we should find, I think we should put our money where our threats are. Focus it on the short range threats and do the long range research. Make sure the thing works before we actually buy it. Thank you. Anything else in the room? We are over, so this is great. Thank you very much.